So hello everyone, my name is Sean. I'm the president of the Alaska Alpine Club and I'm joined here by Nick Jansen who will host this meeting on climbing and mountaineering gear. Um, we have one more lecture coming up after this planned. It's by Joanna Young and she's gonna give a great lecture on glaciers. She is a glaciologist with the UAF GI Institute. So stay tuned for information about that. That'll be not next week, but the week after that, I believe April 15th at the same time. So stay tuned. In the meantime, um, we'll get started with this lecture. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll also have a question and answer time afterwards if you have anything else that didn't get answered. So thank you and take it away, Nick. Thanks, Sean. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, we regret not to be able to do this in person, but uh, I've been enjoying watching these Zoom lectures. The first two were um, very helpful, I think, and this seems like a good alternative. Uh, we're going to be doing climbing gear. This is one of our typical ski mountaineering class lectures. Um, I unfortunately won't be able to pass gear around for obvious reasons. Um, so I have a lot of photos. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you know, if you put them in the chat window. I'll stop and uh, try to address them. Um, all right, let's get started. So some of the stuff that I want to talk about are uh, skis, snowshoes, um, glacier gear, avalanche gear, anchors, overnight gear, and um, there's some recommended reading here. Freedom of the Hills is highly recommended. Um, there are dozens of chapters in that book that are useful and applicable. That's kind of what we teach out of, but um, try to make this Alaska specific and answer specific questions about uh, interior Alaska where uh, approach distances are long and um, overnights are very common. So I'm showing this triangle here on the screen that is um, shows the trade-offs between gear that is lightweight, gear that is durable, and gear that is affordable. So you may have uh, the lightest of the light gear, but it is neither durable nor affordable. You might be over here and have moderately lightweight, moderately durable gear, uh, and it is not affordable, et cetera. So uh, these are kind of the three things that I consider when I'm buying things. Um, you know, used gear is a, is a good option. Um, we won't have a gear swap this year for, again, obvious reasons. But um, I tend to want to be sort of in this area right here, lightweight and durable. But when I was a grad student, I was probably a little bit more towards affordable. So everyone will find themselves at a different, different part there. So let's start with, um, uh, what's what I have here? Skis, snowshoes, and I can't see my whole screen. Uh, is there a step to split board? So uh, these are kind of the three different methods for traveling over snow uh, in a ski mountaineering situation. Skis are obviously the most common and there are benefits. Snowshoes are not as common, but um, when we had the class, we were certainly allowing them. Uh, Frank would always say, and I think quite accurately that for skiers and snowshoers, the approach would be right about the same. Everybody would keep pace with each other. We would have a good time. We'd spend a couple nights up on the glacier. And then on the last day back to the cars, the skiers would be there in 30 minutes and the snowshoers would be four hours. So um, that's big difference. Snowshoes are simple. They're intuitive, easy to use, affordable. There's only, there's very few different designs to get into. Uh, you can wear any boot with them. Skis, as you'll see, we're gonna talk a lot more about because they're very complicated. The bindings are complicated. The boots are complicated. Um, you know, they require lots of uh, specialized knowledge. And when you do invest in a pair, they are really only very good for a narrow spectrum of applications. Uh, for those of you who are snowboarders, uh, definitely split boards are uh, becoming a lot more common in the mountains. They're excellent for good approaches on powdery snow, deep powder. Uh, so we'll talk about those a little bit. Um, okay, so let's first talk about skis. Uh, some of the uh, features and considerations that you would have for buying a pair of skis or um, selecting one for a trip. Are you looking to make turns for fun on steep terrain? Is that your goal? Are you just looking to tour and you're gonna stay away from the steeper terrains and you're just 
trying to put miles on and go from glacier to glacier, that will affect your decision. Um, whether or not you have camber on your skis, uh, camber would be if you look at a ski from the side, whether or not there's any curve or, or hump to it, that's what allows you to uh, transfer your weight and actually get kick when you're moving forward. Edges, um, if people who are into Nordic skiing probably don't use edges, but uh, for pretty much all skis and um, even split boards, metal edges are a requirement for ski mountaineering. They're what allow you to actually gain purchase over tougher snow, sistrugi, hard pack, things like that. So um, metal edges, very much a requirement. So along all the outside of all of these skis that you're gonna see here, um, you have metal edges. Uh, waxable versus waxless. Waxable skis are not very common in a ski mountaineering application, though uh, if you are touring on a pair of, you know, Nordic backcountry skis with a camber to them, some folks do use wax, but don't expect to be able to go up very steep terrain with those. Waxless skis would come in the form of generally fish scales, but there's also some with integral skins that are being built. Those are mostly for Nordic skiing. Um, so I'm more or less talking about these types of skis, uh, like a backcountry ski. Um, in order to make these types of skis, alpine skis go, go uphill or go forward, we'll talk about those. You're gonna need a pair of skins. Um, the weight of the ski, these skis like this are going to be a lot lighter. Um, skis like this are heavier, but they're designed for this type of application. Um, but, you know, be wary of buying skis that are, aren't, I, for instance, have a pair of resort skis that I picked up at a gear swap for like $15, and they have a full metal plate in them. Um, so the weight was not a consideration, obviously, there. Um, and they're, they're kind of clunky to bring into the backcountry, so think about that. Um, cost is a, also an issue. Um, skis can be very expensive. You know, a pair like this probably run you six to $800, um, depending on what you're looking to do with them. And, you know, you're going to spend a lot of money. And like I said, if they're specialized for one application, you're going to drop a lot of money on just that one application. So it's, it's worth thinking about what are your objectives? Are you trying to turn or are you trying to tour or some combination of both? Um, some of the styles and terms that you're going to hear are um, backcountry, backcountry skis, which are um, really sort of a slightly wider Nordic ski with metal edges, like what you're seeing here. Um, Alpine touring skis, which are generally, you put skins on the bottom, they're wider underfoot, say at least 80 millimeters underfoot. Um, they have some side cut generally to them. And then you'll see uh, the term randonnée skis, which refers to a specific sport also referred to as schemo or ski mountaineering racing, which is, uh, I don't think I have any photos of here, but they're a, a shorter, um, generally 160 centimeter long ski, narrow waist, like 55 or 60 centimeter or millimeters. Uh, and they are meant for turning, but they're uh, an ultra light ski. They're not meant to have fun. They're meant for racing. Um, and so they do make a good mountaineering approach ski because they are light. They give you plenty of surface area to spread out, and yet you can still glide down hills on them. So, um, so one of the considerations we're making in interior Alaska are long distances, you know, to ski up the Kastner Glacier, you're looking at a what, six to eight mile approach um, just to get start accessing some of the, uh, the peaks back there, sometimes more than that. So um, putting lots of miles on is um, a necessity. Um, Let's go to bindings. So the bindings are going to be what attaches your boot to the ski. I've laid out several different common options here. Um, a lot of the considerations for what kind of bindings you're, you're looking at will be uh, manual bindings versus automatic. Automatic ones are where you just step your foot in and it automatically engages. And uh, manual ones are you actually have to you know, lock something down. Um, and the reason I list that is because considering getting snow and ice in your bindings, it's a lot easier to dislodge snow from certain bindings versus others. And that's a major consideration. So um, these DinaFit style bindings are, um, they eject snow very well. They're designed for that type of thing. They'll even, when they engage, clean the snow out of the, the um, barrels on your 
um, your binding bit itself. So um, manual bindings easier to clean than auto. Autos are kind of a, um, a no-no. Uh, Step-in bindings are like what I'm showing here. Um, heel elevators, that's a feature of you know being able to uh, rotate this, for instance, and then prop your heel up to change the the to put an angle between the ski and the terrain so that if you're going up hills consistently, you don't have to drop your heel down when you're climbing. Um, a lot of good mountaineering skis have that feature. The release or the din setting, that is gonna be how, how easily your boot rolls out of the binding um, when there's a torque sense there. So when you crash or you wreck, rather than having all that energy of the fall go into your ankle, it'll go into popping your your boot out of the binding. So that's an important feature. Uh, all the bindings that we generally use on Alpine skis are, uh, there's a DIN setting. And so that allows you to set, if you're a really good skier, you probably tighten that up because you're used to you know, stressing your ankles and making very steep turns and you do not want to come out of your bindings on a steep turn. Um, but on, an, on shallower terrain, if you're not that good a skier and you think you might, you know, there's a good likelihood you're gonna wreck, then you wanna uh, calibrate that release. So before you go and start making turns and putting skis on your feet, make sure you understand that or you've had somebody that understands that review the setting on your skis. Compatibility, um, there are bindings, um, particular Silvretta bindings you'll see are very common up here because they're compatible with many different style boots. These will take a mountaineering boot, an alpine touring boot, um, and anything really with a, a heel welt like this. So it's almost like a crampon fitting in the back. These have a DIN release. Um, they're adjustable for different boot sizes. So these Silvretta bindings are, um, they don't make them anymore. They're kind of hard to come by. I think Outdoor Adventures rents them and has a pretty good selection. But if you generally, if you find a pair of these, you want to buy them. Um, these are kind of how everybody gets started because it allows you to wear a mountaineering boot and do climbing activities while doing a ski approach. Um, but second most common I would say are, or another alternative to those is like a Fritchie binding, like what I'm showing on the lower right here. Uh, those are continued to be made. They don't quite fit as well. They can be made to fit a mountaineering boot, but they're, um, they're another option. Uh, heel elevation, okay, I said that, release, compatibility. Um, one thing to keep in mind with all of these bindings is that an important feature is that you have to have a heel that can release to allow your ankle to flex so that when you're approaching, you can actually lift your ankle because you're, you're going to be doing that with every step. Um, you know, when you go to a resort and you click in your ski boot into your skis and your boot just stays fixed, you'll find it very hard to move around. That's not what we're doing when we're doing a ski approach. We are uh, releasing our heels and trying to actually get kick and glide out of it. So um, those folks who have these DinaFit or tech bindings know that uh, this uh, heel piece here can rotate, allowing the heel to, to move freely up and down while the toe is connected. Um, you'll, so the other consideration is having brakes on your skis versus having leashes, something to prevent your ski from going shooting down the mountain if it ever comes off your boot. Um, the advantage of brakes are they're they're easier, they always uh, engage if you ever release from uh, a fall. And in an avalanche, that's a good thing because you would wanna have your ski uh, detached from your foot. Leashes are another option, they're uh, lighter, but they do require you to you know, bend over and connect a leash to, from your ski to the ankle. The disadvantage there is of course, if it releases in an avalanche, your skis are gonna be attached to you and, and uh, you won't be able to get away from them. Uh, weight, uh, Dean fit bindings like this are some of the lightest you can find. Silvrettas and Fritchies, look at these, a lot of material there. They are sometimes as much weight as the ski itself. So um, that's another thing to think about. A nice lightweight tech binding like this will save you uh, a lot of heartache. Cost, uh, of course. <laughs> DinaFit bindings are some of the most expensive that there are. They're often machined aluminum parts, uh, very customized. Uh, even 
bindings like this Silvretta here are, um, I think, $300, $350 new if you can find them new. Uh, so, okay, I talked about some of the common styles. Um, there, this is not exhaustive. There are lots of contraptions out there. I've seen um, you know, other types. I've seen three pins used. Um, you know, you can just get, if you're going to get creative, think of what some of these considerations are and what your objectives are. All right, skins. So for skiers and snow um, slip orders, you'll familiarize yourself with these uh, skin materials. There are multiple materials. These are made out of nylon or mohair and they have a nap to them so that uh, when you put this on the bottom of your ski and you slide your ski forward, uh, the fine hairs on the bottom of that will engage. So you'll see material like this. If I run my finger this way, it slides very, very easily. But if I go this way, it stops. So there's a direction to these. Um, there's an adhesive on the bottom that just allows you to stick it to the bottom of the ski. Uh, and there's often uh, some sort of binding system in the front that will attach and then a, a clip in the back that will attach. Um, there's also these kicker skins, which are sort of a shorter version that just buckle around the, the kick zone. Um, the idea is that you can get a little bit of kick and then a little bit of glide as well, like you were Nordic skiing, although it's never really that simple. The most common selection is a full length skin like this. They make them in uh, nylon, which is a, the most popular, and they make them in mohair, which is, in, I think, goat hair, actually. Uh, and the properties are quite different. Mohair glides better, uh, and it is a little bit more water resistant, but it is um, certainly more expensive and it doesn't wear as, as good. Nylon skins tend to absorb water when they start to wear down. I think they start off with a, a treatment, uh, a hydrophobic treatment, and the more you use them, the more they wear down. Um, you'll find that on a hot spring day in the mountains, if you have worn nylon skins, they'll start to gob up and actually um, snow will start to clump up and attach to the bottoms. And um, I've certainly skied in snow where that, that issue happens so bad that you'll have a football sized chunk of snow that comes up with your foot every time you lift your foot. So you've essentially made this glue between your ski and the snow that just grabs everything. Now, in cases like that, there are waxes that you can apply in the field or before you go that help restore some of that uh, hydrophobic uh, quality of, of the skin material. But, um, always try to avoid getting to that point by checking your skins before you go, uh, make sure they're not too worn out. Um, so we talked about full length versus kicker skins, the age and condition of them. Um, De-icing them is that sort of a trick. So if you plan on skiing through any overflow or open water, um, try, to, try to avoid doing that with skins. I'd take the skins off first or take your skis off and walk them across. Um, because water and ice does not play well with the skins, especially with cold air temperatures. They can be very high, hard to de-ice these things. Also take really good care of the bottom, the adhesive part of this, of these skins. Um, you don't want to, um, you don't want to get snow or, or dirt or anything that could be even down, anything that could stick to that surface can't really come back off again. So it, it kind of ruins the adhesive properties. Um, if you do get a lot of snow and ice on it, you'll find they don't stick well to the bottom of the ski, but that's easily addressed by just taking the skin, rolling it up, putting it inside your jacket, and then letting your body heat sort of melt all that out. Um, and then you can reapply your skins. So um, that's sort of one lesson learned also. Um, don't leave your skins on your skis and, or out overnight. Uh, they will freeze and they'll catch snow and then the adhesive quality is ruined. So um, if you're using skins to, to move forward, they're incredibly important. Uh, make sure you also have an alternative way of uh, attaching it in case the adhesive does fail. I know Frank Olive will bring zip ties out and he'll apply those uh, around the ski, the ski in various places to ensure that uh, it stays on if the adhesive fails. Um, there are, like I said, alternatives, fish scales, kick wax, um, but generally in order to, um, to do ski mountaineering, you're going to have to familiarize yourself with skins and um, often full length skins. 
boots. Uh, so I'm showing some different selections of boots. There are uh, mountaineering boots, which have a removable liner. Um, they have there. You can also find mountaineering boots with a with not with no removable liner. Those are a little bit. Those aren't really recommended for overnight trips. For overnight trips, you want to make sure you have a removable liner in your boots so that you can um, pull that out and keep it warm. If you have a boot that doesn't have that feature and you leave it out in the cold overnight, you stick your foot into a frozen chunk of ice in the morning because moisture will inevitably co collect into these boots from uh, sweating. Some boots have an integral gaiter like this. That's um, a useful feature often, adds cost. AT boots, like you see here, um, there are some that are designed for long range kind of ultralight uphill travel, like you'll see that uh, Atomic makes these. Um, Arcteryx has a, a real lightweight uphill boot, and often they'll compromise on downhill performance by doing that. But these AT boots will have a feature in the back that allows you to, um, to, to go into walk mode which lets the ankle articulate forward and backward. Uh, and then when you're going downhill, lock it into place, and now you can make your turns. Uh, so there's a full range of different types of AT boots you can get. If your objectives are to travel and put miles on, you're gonna wanna have something that's lightweight and simple. This one here only has two buckles. That's um, generally means it's probably compromised on the side of downhill turning and optimized for uphill skinning uh, or you know miles and miles on on the flats. The lower right is another AT boot. That one is going to be a little bit more for like a hard charging downhill skier who wants to make turns. You can see four buckles. Um, it's very much a um, optimized for downhill turns, uh, but you're going to probably not articulate your ankle as well, and you'll probably won't have as good a time on the uphills. Common to all of these boots are, if you look in the lower left, there's a zoomed in picture of the heel of a mountaineering boot that has a, a little ridge right where the, the red plastic part is. All of these boots are gonna have that feature to allow a crampon to attach in the back. And so um, make sure that your mountaineering boot has, or, or AT boot has that feature um, because of the types of crampons that we generally use. So that'll be a required feature. Okay, so we talked about uh, removable liners, which are uh, or generally, I would say, a requirement for overnight trips, mountaineering boot, boots, and alpine touring boots. Um, also, you should know that these, these mountaineering boots have um, a steel shank that runs from the toe to the heel. So uh, in fact, I actually have this one on the screen in front of me. This one, there's really no flex. If I try to collapse this, it's perfectly rigid and that allows you when you're kicking into the mountain and um, push, putting your weight onto it, uh, it doesn't just bend and fall out like that, but actually allows you to um, transfer that to your calf muscle. Um, one little trick that you can see I've done on my mountaineering boot is I have added a tech binding bit into the toe and that allows me to use a, a DinaFit binding uh, with this boot. Uh, I don't have any type of heel connector, but just for the toe piece, I can you know, skin in quite comfortably and uh, take the ski off and then actually do climbing with it. Moving on to glacier gear. Uh, let's start with crampons. So here I've, I've laid out a few different common types. Um, there are two things to pay attention to as far as the binding system, the front and the back. You can see the, um, the orange one in the upper left here has um, a, just a simple strap type in the front, whereas you know, the one below it has a wire bail. And then in the back, it's even just a simple strap type as well. It doesn't have a, uh, a cam and lever um, so this type of crampon would be used for, you could put that on really any type of boot, like a hiking boot or, a, you know, like a half mountaineering boot. And so they're really not a technical, but they would be good for walking on flat terrain, glaciers, um, but not, not really for climbing. 
for climbing, you want to make sure that you have a feature um, like these other ones have, which is a, a cam that rests on the heel welt of the boot and clicks into place in the back and um, holds very, very tightly to the boot. Uh, having a crampon come off in the middle of a climb is uh, can be very dangerous. It's something you want to be really sure that doesn't happen. Most of these are adjustable. You, you can see these different hole pegs uh, in the middle. That allows you to adjust it for different size boots. One good thing, one required thing to do is before you head out on a trip, make sure you have uh, actually fixed the crampon to the boot and make sure that it fits. Make sure you've already made those adjustments. Uh, that will end your trip um, very quickly if you find you can't attach the crampon to your boot. Uh, you also notice there are different types of front points here. Uh, there's hor horizontal front points, as in the uh, black diamond saber tooth. There's vertical front points. And then you can even see in the bottom left one, there's one single vertical front point. Uh, those are generally a preference thing. Horizontal front points do better in snow because they actually have some uh, surface area and, and don't just slice right through the snow. Um, vertical front points do better in ice, although some would argue they don't. Um, and then model points do good on ice and then also good on rock as well. Um, you can just articulate you know, your, your toe and set it on uh, one tiny portion of a rock and then not, not worry about the two points sort of pushing your, your foot away with your, if your ankle rotates at all. Um, so for mountaineering, generally, these horizontal front points are going to be recommended. Uh, there's different materials. Steel is the most common, but there, we're seeing a lot come out in aluminum, like in the lower right, the green one. Oops, I'm glad. And that is a weight saver, but uh, they don't last very long at all. Uh, a couple, few trips, and they'll be pretty rounded. You can sharpen these, you know, with a steel file, but uh, you know, you only have so much to work with there. Okay, moving on to harnesses. Uh, I've laid out a few different styles here. Uh, the black one is kind of the most common entry level. Uh, that's called the Black Diamond Alpine Bod Harness. That one goes on like a belt, and then you reach between your legs and pull the uh, middle part up and connect that that loop to your belt with a locking carabiner. So you'll see this harness here doesn't have that locking carabiner on it. That is because, uh, well, it's, it's obviously sold separately, but this, this harness will not function without that locker carabiner in place. So just wearing the harness as is shown here, uh, not enough. This is, it's not complete. The advantage though of this harness is that if you've got um, pants, you know, big, uh, say Gore-Tex pants and you know a big puffy jacket. You can put this harness on around all of that very easily, and you know just clip your carabiner into place, and you don't have to you know step into anything. Uh, whereas the two on the right, you can see, are more like a rock climbing harness. You would have to try to fish your boot and cramp on and uh, a Gore-Tex pants through these leg loops, which you'll find very difficult to do while standing on one leg on a slope. So um, some people do use these step-in harnesses, but uh, I don't really recommend them. If you do, you know, on any of these harnesses, really make sure that they're big enough to go around all of the layers of clothing that you intend to wear. Trying it on, you know, at Beaver Sports is one thing when you're wearing jeans, but putting it on over top of all your layers and finding out I can't actually fit into this thing um, isn't, isn't something you want to have happen. The orange harness on the lower left is sort of a compromise harness between the two. Uh, it's very, very lightweight and minimal. It goes on also like a belt, but it also has, instead of a locker carabiner, it has this white belay loop. That allows you to actually um, belay somebody and uh, so that's a really nice feature to have if you're doing slightly more technical climbing. On to helmets. So I've shown a few different styles here. Probably the most common is this upper left one. Um, it's just a plastic outer shell with a closed cell foam um, interior, the part that actually protects your head. 
uh, climbing harness, climbing harnesses like mountaineering harnesses only really protect from a fall from from the top. So you're you're trying to rock and ice fall uh, coming to you from straight up. That's what you're protecting from. You're not trying to protect uh, from a side impact or uh, anything like that. Although I think this Gravel one does. Um, but just make sure that you understand, you know, what you're buying before you get that. There's another style that's kind of come out that uh, that I tend to like. It's this 100% um, closed cell foam um, helmet, this orange one on the upper right. It's uh, very, very light. It saves that by not using the plastic shell. Um, what else do I have under here? Uh, there's a, a, I think I'm showing a ski helmet on the bottom right. So that's that's something different too. Skiers, you'll be familiar with those types of helmets. They can be used for mountaineering. Um, I would just caution you, your, you know, your ears are covered, so you're not going to hear things like, you know, whooping and your partner's talking to you as well. Uh, also, they're in the heat of the, you know, on the glacier when the sun is out and beating down, they're not a very pleasant thing to be wearing. Um, helmets like this are single use, so if you catch a really big rock or chunk of ice, these helmets will fracture and break and they're designed to do that. I mean, they're taking the, the, the energy of that impact away from your skull. Um, once that happens, retire the helmet. I have five or six helmets that, that are all that's applied to. And so unfortunately when that happens, you know, you've just got to pony up the money and, and buy a new one. Um, you know, it's, in the grand scheme of things, 60 bucks or 80 bucks is just not worth a head injury. So that's my spiel on helmets. Ice axes, you may also hear these called PLAs. And there are many different styles. I'm starting on the left with a straight shaft. Um, these come in generally 60, 70 centimeter lengths. There are different parts. On the bottom is the spike, middle is the shaft, and then on the on the top you'll see the head and the um, the pick, which is on the right side of all of these. You'll also see a couple different styles on the upper left. You'll see this little scoop that's called an ads a d z e ads, or you'll see a hammer on some of these more technical tools. Um, so. If you're going to have two, it's nice to have one tool for um, for each. The reason why these tools look so different is the straighter the shaft, the easier it is for plunging into snow, which is what keeps you attached to the mountain when you're climbing a steep slope. Um, on the far right, you'll see a much more technically curved and gripped tool that's more designed for technical ice climbing. But you can see that the disadvantage of something like that is if you are climbing steep snow, it really does not plunge into the snow. In fact, it's quite poor at it. Some will actually turn it upside down and try to plunge the head into the snow uh, if they have to. But you can see there is a couple of tools in between those two that are compromises. So the orange one here would be, <coughs> excuse me, a, a really good tool for technical mountaineering where perhaps a short pitch of ice might be expected or uh, you know al steep alpine ice but non-technical and then the you know the second from the right the um, petzl i think that's a Aztar, is something that can be configured to remove the grip and still plunge fairly well and still climb ice fairly well so um, pretty good so those are some of the different functions um, you also are going to use the ice axe for stopping a fall. If you do uh, start sliding down the mountain, you're going to roll onto your ice axe and, and jam the pick into the snow to try to stop the fall. Really, only the, the one here with the leash on is capable of doing that. The others aren't going to be very good uh, at that. So really something like this, uh, I don't see the brand name on it, but it's a 60 centimeter straight shaft PLA with an ads and a leash. These are going to be the most common. Um, some folks in Alaska, and especially interior Alaska, where it's very cold, will put insulation around the head and just kind of tape it on. That's right where you're going to grab it. And so that prevents a lot of heat from being drawn away from your hand. Um, my ice axe does not have a leash on it. 
it's something I'm just used to not dropping. Um, whenever you're zigzagging up a hill, you have to switch hands. And so having to pull it out of the loop each time takes a lot of time and slows the whole team down. So um, that's not something I do. So one thing we do teach though in ski mountaineering is to, um, to take a piece of webbing and attach the ice ax to your harness so that when you plunge the ice ax into the, into the snow in front of you, if you were to slip and fall, it would only pull that ice ax in deeper and um, prevent you from sliding. Okay, um, that's about it for ice axes. Ropes. Uh, there are three different methods of roping, and you can see them illustrated here. Uh, on the, the pink one in the middle is called single roping, where you have a climber um, placing protection and clipping every piece on one single rope. So the rope is going to be uh, thick enough to hold the fall, and it's going to stretch dynamically to absorb the fall. You can see in the middle, half or double roping. Um, don't get confused by that. Half and double roping is the same thing, um, even though it doesn't make any sense mathematically. You'll see alternate anchors being placed in a zigzag fashion and some ropes being, one rope being clipped all on the left points and one rope being clipped all on the right points. So if you're taking a wandery route, uh, you can sort of protect all ones on one side with one rope and ones on the other. The other advantage is if you have a half or double rope, you can tie the two together and get a full length of rappel, whereas a single rope, if you had to you know, double it over, you would get only half the length of a rappel. The other advantage is you can split the weight up. You can give your partner half the rope and you can take half the rope, whereas a single um, sits in one poor sap's backpack the entire trip. Uh, and then there's twin ropes on the far right where the ropes themselves are smaller diameter, like six or seven mil and they're, they have to be clipped together in this as if you were climbing, uh, it's like single roping. Um, and so they're by themselves not thick enough to take the weight of an entire fall. This has the same advantage of being able to split the weight up. Um, glacier ropes are often on the thinner side. So if you were buying a twin rope like that, um, that would be a good rope to have for a glacier. Um, Make sure whatever ropes you're buying are dynamic. They sell static ropes. Those are not for climbing. Those are only for uh, rappelling. Um, some ropes have a dry treatment, which is a good feature to have when you're expecting a rope to get wet. Uh, if they get wet and freeze, they can gain a lot of weight and become unusable as well. So um, rope, buying the right rope for glacier travel is also going to be one of the best decisions that you can make to save weight in your pack. Um, a, the difference in weight between a 30 meter, seven mil Edelweiss rope and a 70 meter single 11 mil rope is probably a factor of five or six. So um, that's, that's something to really think about. Lengths are generally, um, and we'll talk, we we'll normally talk about this in the classes, a uh, 30 meter rope is going to be about as small as you want for a two person team, two person teams, you know, no, that's as small as you can go. That's pretty much uh, if you're a glacier travel expert, three or four people is better on a rope team. And then you would want a 60 or 70 meter rope. Um, okay, we'll move on. Here's a few different style of uh, carabiners. The ultimate goal is to, um, for a carabiner is to uh, allow the clipping of um, slings and transferring of weight in an anchor system. You can see just about every style imaginable. Some of the main things are locking versus non-locking. Um, our glacier kit generally consists of two locking carabiners and two non-locking carabiners at a minimum. Um, locking carabiners are of you know screw gate, twist lock, um, multiple styles. There's a lot of fancy designs out there but uh, some of them are more susceptible to freezing up. Uh, a good old twist lock or screw type um, screw gate carabiner is uh, the most resistant to freezing up. You can always melt it out and get the um, thread to turn again. Um, sometimes you'll see them clipped uh, like you see on the right, which is called an Alpine quick draw. Two carabiners, one sling that allows one end to be clipped to an anchor and the other end to be clipped to a rope. 
Uh, slings come in Dyneema, nylon, Spectra, various materials. Um, Dyneema is probably the, the best choice and most common. Nylon tends to absorb water um, and Spectra doesn't really stretch very much. Okay, just some miscellaneous pieces of gear that you'll want to have for glacier travel. We require two pulleys. So um, when we are doing glacier extractions and pulling somebody out of a crevasse, um, at least two pulleys are needed for a three to one system. Um, these pulleys uh, just swing open, the rope runs over the, um, the pulley part, and then a carabiner clips in here and um, prevents the uh, pulley from opening up then. You can also see uh, they make some devices that are like a pulley with a built-in uh, one-way traction device that's called a Petzl micro traction. Those are very expensive, but they're extremely handy. So it's like a basically a one-way pulley. Um, the upper right, I'm showing what are called tie blocks. Those are uh, sort of like an ascender, you know, one way on the rope, pull down and it, and it grabs. Those are good for climbing up a rope, should you ever fall into a crack. Um, showing glacier wands at the bottom. Those are for marking your route. Um, they're kind of falling by the wayside because of GPS technology. I mean, you can kind of follow your path, but um, these are still, you'll see these on expedition climbs in um, like the Alaska range. Two wands like this mark the, a crevasse, so you know, don't go towards it. Um, single wands mark the route. In bad weather, it'll be uh, like you're, you're climbing, like they say, on the inside of a ping pong ball. You'll see white in all directions and you won't really be able to navigate. So maybe you climbed up, the weather got bad and now you can't climb back down because your tracks are covered. Uh, that's where the, the wands come in. So these are just bamboo sticks with little flags on the top you can make out of duct tape. So last lecture, Mark Old Mixon talked about avalanche gear already, but we'll just quickly cover it here because this is a required material. Um, and the avalanche kit consists of beacon shovel probe. Nothing less than that. Um, I also put on here batteries and just remind everybody that we don't use lithium batteries in our beacons because the voltage profile is too flat. You won't be able to tell you how much life is left in the battery. And then all of a sudden when it's dead, it drops off and goes from 98% to zero. Uh, whereas alkaline batteries have a much more linear drop off. You'll be able to assess the life of uh, lithium, uh, alkaline batteries much more accurately. The beacons are always carried on us when we're in avalanche terrain, not in our backpack. And most of them, like in this photo here, have a harness system that allow you to strap it to your base layer. And then you'll put all your other layers on top of that. So you're not always having to take it off. Uh, probe, pretty straightforward. Don't think that you can use a tent pole for that. This has to be, um, has to be an actual designed avalanche probe. And then a shovel, often two parts. Nice thing about the shovel plate is it serves multiple purposes. You can set your stove on it when you're cooking so that it doesn't melt into the snow. Okay. Hydration. So I've shown a, a few different options here that um, I have seen, some of which I've used, some of which I have not. Um, from the left to the right are my preference for best options versus worst options. Um, why, so anybody in, in the chat want to guess as to why I showed the first two upside down? While you're guessing, I'll talk about the camelbacks. A lot of folks, oh, keep them from freezing shut. Yes, correct, Michelle. Um, the only, the first place it's going to freeze and the part that matters most to you is the cap in order to keep the cap from freezing, uh, try to have the air gap, which is where it's going to freeze first at the top of the um, air at the bottom of the device away from the cap. Um, so the reason why I put uh, the, an insulated Nalgene on the far left is because um, they're the least likely to freeze over. You have a, a case that has a full zipper around it that 
you know, surrounds the entire Nalgene bottle so that it, it, it's fully insulated. If you put hot water in that Nalgene bottle and inside the insulated uh, cozy, it will stay warm for um, a much longer time. I'm showing a platypus here because I do use one. I like how they collapse down and basically disappear in your pack, but there's only one way to carry it, and that is to have it against your back the entire time so that your, your back, when you're moving, is always adding heat to it. Um, otherwise, you can tell they would freeze very quickly. There's not a good way to insulate them. Uh, camelbacks, I've seen some folks use that. I have definitely tried to work a hose, a hydration hose into my uh, system. They, the theory is that if you blow air into the hose and push the water back into your back, um, then the hose won't freeze over. I have never gotten that to work. The nozzle always freezes over and you end up not using the hose and then you have to pull this pouch out that um, is you know, rather clumsy and you've got a frozen hose that you can't do anything about. Um, and then the Nalgene's with the, the small cap. Um, a few reasons why you wouldn't like that. It's a lot harder to pour water into without spilling. Um, it freezes over much more quickly. So, um, you know, they tend to freeze over from the outside in. So it doesn't take very long for that inch diameter hole to freeze shut. Whereas, uh, you know, a full Nalgene, you're looking at the three inch opening. Sport bottles like uh, you would have on your bike, just don't bring them. All right, next topic, anchors. We're gonna talk about rock anchors, snow anchors, and ice anchors. And we will use anchors for repelling, belaying, crevasse rescue. And since you have them, you may as well use them to secure your tent. First, rock anchors. I'm actually gonna get a visual aid on this because a lot easier to show than tell. Okay. So the first on, and uh, one you see in the blue is a spring loaded camming device. These are what are called a type of active protection. So these will go into the opening like this. The cam lobes will open up. And when you pull back, they, you, it won't be able to pull out. So they make these in all different sizes, of course, for you know different size openings. Rock climbers are used to using them. Uh, I have seen some mountaineers carry a few small ones that they know what size they're gonna need. Uh, they're not very common in mountaineering and especially not in Alaska mountaineering. Uh, but you should know what they are and how to use them. Other types of rock anchors, you can see the um, small colored hexagon shapes um, or a little, the little, um, these are called nuts. That's a type of passive protection. Really, it's not meant to articulate or move at all. It's just meant to slot into a, a crack and then wedge in. When you give it a tug, it just sits in there. Uh, no, that's another type of rock anchor. On the bottom, you can see these pins. Uh, those are called pitons. All different kinds of shapes of pitons. I think I might even have some. Yeah, all different types. These are used by aid climbers. And so you can see something like this. You would just pound into an opening, clip your carabiner on here, and now you've got an anchor. Uh, depending on the quality of rock, it could be a very good anchor or a very bad anchor. Anchor building is not something we're gonna go into detail on this uh, lecture. I'm just talking about the gear. Uh, this, this, the uh, science of anchor building, we could do an entire semester long class on that. But um, these pitons are something you should know about. They're probably some of the better rock anchors you would use in alpine mountaineering, especially in interior Alaska. Uh, where the rock quality is pretty bad. Um, so that's rock anchors, snow anchors. There's a couple different options. The most common is the one on the right here, those snow pickets. They just have a, a T-shaped profile. They're made out of aluminum and they have holes drilled intermittently. Those can be either pounded straight into the snow if the snow is firm enough, or they can be buried to make a dead man anchor, like what you're seeing in, uh, in the 
the illustration below. The other option is a fluke. These are these sort of paddle looking uh, anchors with uh, the wires coming out that's on the top left. These are less and less common now, um, but I do have a few. And then uh, the lower left is an illustration of a snow bollard, which is really just a chipped shape in the, in the snow. This would actually have to be very firm snow where you're, you're actually digging and chipping away. You're not just you know, using your hand to excavate there. If the snow is soft, but obviously the rope will cut right through it. Um, and on this one, they've actually padded the um, space between the rope and the snow to uh, spread that weight out a little bit. So um, that's another snow anchor. Um, ice anchors, there's not many options. Generally, uh, these specters, which are, um, they're good in you know, frozen mud and choss and thin ice and just about any condition, but they're not as um, solid. And then on the right, ice screws, very common. Um, whenever we go on glacier mountaineering trips, everyone should have at least one ice screw on them. Um, they come in all different lengths. Generally in alpine mountaineering, the lo you know, longer ones are better, 19 to 21 centimeters. Um, because there's really very little risk of ever bottoming out the, the screw. Ice climbers don't like very long screws because they're often climbing ice that's only, you know, a few inches thick. And so you can, if you put the screw in and it hits rock behind it, the, the screw placement is, uh, is not good. So, but when you have, you know, ice seracs that are um, eons thick, we don't worry about uh, finding the bottom of that. Okay, uh, we're almost done talking about overnight gear, um, tents. I'm showing a few common options here. Um, some of the considerations are double versus single wall. Um, a double wall tent is obviously it's, um, you know, protects you from the elements a little bit better. Can anyone else guess what the, another major advantage is of a double wall versus a single wall tent and post it in the chat? While you guys do that, also consider how you anchor these. Um, I stopped trying to do any, bring any kind of snow stake with me on any kind of a trip. Um, placing a snow stake is rarely effective. Instead, I started using these little canvas parachute um, devices, which you can see in the bottom of the screen. Mountain Hardware makes them. All you do is take a chunk of snow and stuff it in and then bury that. And within minutes, you'll find that it doesn't pull out. And in fact, the next morning, you'll find that you might even have to chip it out. So those, those make excellent um, snow anchors for your tent. So I don't see anybody in the chat yet. Um, double versus single wall. The biggest advantage of a double wall tent is that uh, you have some temperature difference between the inside and outside so that um, when, you're, when all the moisture from your breath and from your drying gear comes up and hits the inside surface of the tent, it doesn't condense and freeze immediately. Uh, whereas a single wall tent, the surface is basically the same temperature as the air temperature outside, which is usually below the dew point. So all of your breath is going to freeze to the inside of the tent. So when you wake up in the morning in a single wall tent, if you are that person that moves around and shakes the tent, it's going to drop all of this snow onto you and your partner. Um, there are some ways of getting around that, like this yellow black diamond, um, they used to call them bibblers, has sort of a felt material on the inside. And the idea is that if there's some insulating layer there to prevent condensation or at least help it not to stick. Um, on the bottom right, the green first light tent is a very common one because they're very small and lightweight. Um, but the big disadvantage is, of course, it's a single wall tent and they get very wet and they collect uh, all the moisture and freeze on the inside very easily. Um, whether or not you use a vestibule, like on a multi-day expedition trip, a vestibule is a nice thing to have as a safe place to, to cook out of the elements. Some people will cook inside their single wall tent. They make uh, hanging kits for your stove to do that. Um, Okay, I'll just move on. Sleeping systems. 
Uh, generally, uh, a mummy bag, you know, sized accordingly. They make them in male and female and different um, heights, and they even make um, extended ones for people who are, you know, over six feet. Uh, the big consideration there is uh, down versus synthetic. Down is much warmer for the weight; it's more compressible. Um, but the, the disadvantage is when that gets wet. It's, it doesn't keep you warm and it's very difficult to dry. So synthetic bags are, are better in, for instance, as a summer bag where it's possible it could, you could run into some rain. But for winter mountaineering, most folks use down. Um, thinking about the temperature rating, um, you know, they make bags all the way down to minus 40. Not completely necessary, um, depends on what you're trying to do and when, but um, keep in mind, you're gonna have a big puffy down coat on, potentially down pants. Um, so you don't necessarily need the coldest of the cold rated bag uh, for all nights, but certainly don't think about anything rated for a temperature above, you know, 15 degrees if you're talking about winter, winter mountaineering in Alaska. The second uh, most important th part of your sleeping system then, of course, is the, uh, the insulation between your bag and the snow. Uh, if you've ever tried to sleep a night on, directly on snow without a mat, you probably lost a lot of sleep. There needs to be some insulation between the ground and you, otherwise you will um, constantly be sinking into a melting pool of water um, all night. So a lot of folks bring something like what you see here, a ridge rest that just rolls up and you strap it on the outside of your pack. They're light, cheap, and um, they're uh, pretty hard to, to destroy. Some folks like myself use a Neo Air mat, and so these are these take up less room in your pack. They're actually lighter than the closed cell foam. But of course, if you get a leak in these, they're, you know, they have to be repealed, repaired if that happens. Um, they're noisy. So if you're rolling around on it, you might keep your partner up. On to stoves. Uh, there's generally two categories, um, isobutane or canister stoves and white gas stoves. So, you know, white gas is the style where you have a separate pressurized bottle, you put the liquid in, and then there's an integral pump that, you know, you're applying air pressure, uh, a valve that then opens it up, and much of these have to be primed, you know, so you get a flame going with a little bit of um, heat, and once the heat starts vaporizing the fuel, you can turn it up, and now you've got um, vaporizing fuel going into your, your flame. These are the most common stoves for, for cold temperatures in interior Alaska because of their um, they're very robust. Um, you can carry lots of fuel. You know, you can put a gallon of fuel in your pack and have enough to, to last you, you know, you're a team of three for 10 days. Um, isobutane stoves, canister stoves will run out. And as they run out, the pressure goes down and they're very hard to, um, to, to stay running. So what I have, what I'm showing here right in the middle though, is an MSR reactor stove, which uses isobutane. Um, what this stove is meant to do is once you have these ice, these canister stoves really suffer from low pressure in the cold. The cold just tends to make the pressure go down. So what reactor figured out how to do is if you take the stove and, and dip the canister in the water, the coldest that that can be now is 32 degrees. That increases the pressure of the stove. The stove reacts to that change in temperature. You'll see it as soon as you drop it in the water, it, it fires up. Um, and so you can do that, but then of course you take it out and sometimes you're switching them a lot. So it's really hard to fight these things in the cold. But if your trip is, you know, gonna be generally above zero degrees, um, this can be a good option. The jet boil is another, another version. Um, some people bring a shield in order to kind of protect the flame from, you know, wind. Uh, it's also just much more efficient to kind of concentrate and focus that heat up onto the, uh, the pot. Keep in mind that if you do bring a stove like this, you need to have also bring another pot uh, for melting water, melting snow to get water, sorry. Uh, the general rule that I use when planning is four to six ounces of white gas per person per day. And I've found that to be a pretty good science. If you think that you're gonna be running into natural flowing water, you can you know, be more on the side of four ounces if you know you're gonna be in the high alpine with absolutely no water and you're gonna be doing a lot of moving and a lot of drinking of water, six ounces uh, is a, you know, on the high end. Moving on, 
backpacks. So um, all of the stuff obviously has to go in your backpack. Um, it's good to have a selection, but if you have to get one, think about the biggest one that you're going to need to carry everything. How many days out are you going to be? Um, keep in mind that they are different sizes. So, you know, when you say you're looking at an Osprey 2200 or something like that, I'm just making that up. Those are going to come in small, medium, and large, and often in um, men versus women too. So make sure you're buying the right model that fits you. Try it on. Make sure you can move around in it. Make sure the belt sits where it needs to. Um, don't just buy a pack because it looks right. Um, you know, definitely try it on. Make sure it's properly sized. Uh, features versus minimalists. Uh, you'll see a lot of packs like on the lower left here that have a lot of outside pouches and zippers and features and buckles uh, and hoops and places to clip things. Um, a lot of those look really good on paper, but they, the only thing they generally do is add weight and uh, complicate things. I much more prefer a um, more minimalist pack like you see on the top left, the white pack, which is a Hyperlite Mountain Gear, which is really just a big Cuban fiber sack that you can just stuff everything in, cinch it down, and the pack itself weighs so little. Um, internal versus external frame. Um, most mountaineering packs nowadays are internal frame. External frame you see very rarely, except maybe if you're like a, a hunter. Um, pack, your, pack your bag in the right order to, you know, when you're preparing, what, what's the first thing that's gonna go in your pack? It's the last thing you're gonna use, which is probably your sleeping bag because you won't have your sleeping bag until you have your tent up and you won't have your tent up until you arrive at camp. So, um, you know, think about water and food and puppy layer towards the top, everything else in the middle, and then, you know, sleeping bag, tent, that sort of thing at the bottom. Um, generally, all of my down and tents and all these things, I just stuff right into the bag. I don't try to roll them up and put, you know, nice even rolls in there. They actually fit better and they fill the pack better if you just stuff them in. So don't try to you know, separate them out and put them in different pouches and drawstring bags. That's uh, not something that's uh, usually worth your time. Okay, I believe that is all I have. I'm sure there's probably some questions and discussion. So um, we can open it up. You can either unmute yourself or post a question in the chat window if you have one. If no one has any questions, I'm just going to make Sean ask some. <laughs> what temperature sleeping bag do you normally bring? I have a 15 degree bag. I, I have a very, very warm puppy jacket, so climb into that thing and, um, you know, two other people in a two-person tent, and I'm nice and toasty. Thanks, Michelle. Well, does anyone have any more questions? If not, and you find you have a question that comes up, I don't know, later tonight or tomorrow or something, feel free to email me or Nick or anyone in the club. Um, we'd love to share info. If okay. not, we'll go ahead. If there is anything, but if you have any Alpine Club business you wanted to talk about, you can be free, Sean. Yeah, so just a reminder, we have at least one more lecture coming up. That'll be not this Thursday, but next Thursday, uh, I believe April 15th. That'll be with Joanna Young from the Geophysical Institute. She will be talking about lectures and it's a really cool lecture. So please attend if you are free. Um, other than that, we don't have, we may have one more meeting. Um, I'm not entirely sure yet. If not, that will be, 
probably the end of the ski mountaineering clinic for this year. Um, unfortunately, I, I wish we could have done it in person, but I think we've made the most of the circumstances. So thank you everyone for joining. If you missed, missed the meeting tonight or know someone who missed the meeting tonight, we did record it and we will post it on our website. So check there in a couple of days or so. All right, thank you. Thanks everybody.